So if you could have one prayer answered before we leave this service today, what would that prayer be? We all have a different answer probably to that prayer, or some of us may have the same answer. But if you could have one prayer answered, what would that prayer be? What would that answer be? Maybe you have been seeking that answer for a short time. Maybe you've been seeking that answer for a very long time. But I believe that God is our source. I believe, as I've said earlier, that we can trust God. If you can't trust God, who can you trust? God is not a man that he should lie. God is truth, and his Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. And that is especially important in the day and age that we live because people are searching for truth. There are very many, many sources of information. Not all information that you receive is true. Don't believe everything you hear. But what you hear, you need the Holy Spirit of God to guide you into all truth so you know what is right and what is wrong, what is real and what is fake. So today, I don't expect you to get overly excited about my theme. Humility. Some of you may be saying, well, I'm proud to be humble, Pastor. We need to look back at the verse that we started looking at last week, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Very familiar to many people, but this verse, I'm going to be spending uh, a few weeks on this very verse because there's so much to unpack. But this verse says, if my people who are called by my name, and we talked about that last week, the, about our identity. Who are you? Whose are you? Are you a child of God? Because in this whole process, as I mentioned, that you uh, confess your sins, you repent of your sins, God makes you through his Holy Spirit, he regenerates you, which means he makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's why we call it being born again. And then he adopts us into his own family. So you need to know that if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that you are not only saved, but you're adopted. And I talked about that we no longer have that spirit of bondage, but we can cry out with the spirit of adoption, Abba, Father. So we are children of the King, and you need to know that if you have that relationship. And you and I all need to live up to that potential. Because that's who we are. That's our true identity. And the one who came to steal and kill and destroy cannot take that away from you. If you are a child of God. So if my people, not everyone is his people. As a matter of fact, we live in a society where a lot of people don't want to identify with the name of Jesus. As a matter of fact, it seems to be very polarizing and divisive. But there is no other name given whereby men might be saved than the name of Jesus. And so, of course, the enemy wants to turn people against that name. So, if my people who are called by my name, that's why that we're called Christians, because we follow Christ. Uh, early on, uh, they called us the way. We were people of the way because Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that's where I start losing people. Sometimes humility is not a, uh, an excitable thing that we look for. But it will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And we know uh, as followers of the way, as Christians, that we need God to hear our cries and heal our land. Forgive us and heal our land. 
Our land is sick. Our land needs healing. The United States of America doesn't need a change in Washington, D.C. as much as we need a change in hearts and lives of people to say that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and in him and him alone I will trust. This land is my land. This land needs Jesus more than anything else. That's what this land needs. And so when we're celebrating the independence of this land, we need to realize that just as God said when they dedicated the temple and they had celebrated and they had had all of these festivities and a time of worship and all of the sacrifices, he said that there would be a time when we would need to call on God, that bad times would come. And we know We've all experienced bad times. But the same verse that he gave to them as being what they needed to do is the same verse that we need today. So we need to humble ourselves. See, not a lot of shouting with that. <laughs> we, can, we can't let pride stand in the way of getting the help that we need. Because we know that pride comes before the... Thank you. But sometimes we feel like that we can handle the situation ourselves. I mean, after all, this country was built on that idea of rugged individualism. You know, bless God, I don't like what's going on. I don't like where I'm living, so I'm going to load my family and everything that I own into a buckboard, and I'm just going to go across the country, and I'm going to claim some land, and I'm going to start over. But even in that day, the Lord helped those that called upon his name. Those that humbled themselves and depended upon him, he helped them. But sometimes we need to realize we can't handle our situation ourselves. We need to come to the end of ourselves and say, I need help. And that is a humbling experience. To, it's a humbling admission to say that whatever situation it is that you or I can't handle it, we need help to get out of it. We need help to fix it. But sometimes pride keeps us from asking for help. But when we come to that realization that we can't fix it, that is the beginning of humility. Because we realize that we're going to have to ask for help. And that's humbling to some people because some people want to, to be able to be self-sufficient and I can do it all myself. I can handle it. Whatever the situation is, I can handle it. Well, that sounds good until the whole thing is flying apart and you realize, I may need help. And so then, when we do that and, and realize we can't fix it, then we acknowledge the fact that we have limited power and limited resources and limited intellect and we need to call upon someone who has more power, more resources, and knows everything. Sometimes we think we know everything until we get to the place where we don't know. The older I get, the more I realize what I do not know. And I'm humble enough to admit it. And so we need to seek the Lord, but we need to humble ourselves. And let me tell you, I would rather humble myself I would rather be proactive than to have God humble me. But if you want to take your chances, that's up to you. I can't control you. But I think of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the most powerful kingdom on the earth at that time. But he took for himself glory that belonged to God. And God humbled him by making him live like an animal until he came to the realization, I'm not God. 
it was probably easier when he's out there and his, his nails are getting long and he's eating grass to realize, I don't, think, uh, I don't think God would do that. But when he realized that, God restored him. But I would rather be proactive and try to humble myself than to say, God, here I am. See if you can take me down. Because he has all power and he can do it. And maybe there have been times that you have been humble. And maybe there have been times that it happened through men, uh, and maybe there were times it happened through God. But my advice to you, <laughs> as someone who cares for you and your soul, is humble yourself. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So see, if you do this, well, it doesn't sound appealing, humbling yourself, but there's a reward. And that reward is if you will humble yourself before God, he will lift you up. And so not only does he have the power to humble people, he has the power to lift people up. And when he lifts you up, you know it. And when he lifts you up, you're grateful. And you know that you are being blessed when the Lord lifts you up. But it starts with humbling yourself. First Peter, uh, the last part of verse 5, uh, here says, uh, well, there should be a chapter there, so. It was verse five, or chapter 5, verse 5, the last part of that verse says this. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. See, that, it's humbling to be part of a community where that we all use gifts and talents and abilities that God has, give us, uh, has given to us and we help one another. But see, there's not just one big person who does everything and we're like, thank you. In a community of human beings, we all work together. We all contribute. We all have gifts that God's given us. We all work together. We all do what we can do to help the community. And so that's humbling when you realize I have a part to play. I'm not, you know, the only one. God uses everyone, and he has a plan for all of us, and we are together a part of the body of Christ. And Paul does a wonderful job of talking about the body has many parts, but we're all important. So yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if you are pri uh, proud, prideful, God resists you. So maybe one of the reasons you're experiencing resistance in your life is there may be areas of pride in your life that you need to deal with. Because God resists the proud. But he gives grace, unmerited favor, that amazing grace he gives to the humble. So would you rather have that amazing grace given to you or God working against you? So you need, uh, at some point during this service, at some, maybe while I'm speaking, at the end, you need to ask God, is there any area of pride in my life that needs to be dealt with? Because you don't want God resisting you. Trust me, it's hard enough out there without, on top of it, God pushing against you. So if you want God to help you and give you unmerited favor, then you need to get rid of the pride. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, I often like to quote the last part of that, but let's look at the first part of that. It says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, because he cares for you. Humble yourself and let God exalt you. Don't try to exalt yourself because then God will resist you. But if you humble yourselves and give all glory to God. You know, if I pray for someone and that person is healed, I didn't heal them. Because I don't have healing power. I didn't take stripes on my back so that you might be healed. You know, if I pray for you and God delivers you from bondage, it is God who delivered you, not me. I don't have the power to do that. I have the desire that you be free from bondage, but I don't have the power to break those chains in your life. 
But sometimes you see that the line gets blurred. And people, not God, start taking glory for what God did. Well, God stops using that person. He resists the proud. And so when God uses you and me, we need to make sure that we remember who did the work. He may use us, work through us. We may be a vessel that he uses, but we're not doing the work. (laughs) And if you ever start believing that you're the one doing the work, you will see how quickly your life changes. But not only do we humble ourselves, we need to pray. Now, prayer is something that we know we should do, but we don't always do. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, because I don't know how many people have told me throughout my life, I did everything I needed to do, and then I prayed. So in that, what they're telling me is, I tried every resource, everything I could think of, with my power, my resources, to fix it. And you probably, in that process, you probably get exhausted. What would happen if you cut out the first part of that and just prayed? Don't do everything you know to do. What you need to know to do is to pray. So that way, you could come to me and say, I did everything I knew to do, I prayed. Because worry is the opposite of faith. I talked about that last week. So if you sit there and you wring your hand and you run around and you pace the floor and you're not praying, then you're delaying the answer. If you're posting it all on Facebook, or if you're calling someone up, you know, it's okay to share with someone your prayer need, but that you need to know that that person can get a hold of God. I've had people in my life ask me about a prayer request, not because they were wanting to pray, but because they were just curious. So they wanted to tell someone else what the problem was. And if that's you, then I would have you and the Lord deal with that before you leave here today but don't just talk about praying don't just know up here oh yeah it's logical I have a problem I need to pray at some point you need to stop thinking about it and talking about it and worrying about it and pray (laughs) Paul writes and talks about pray without ceasing sometimes we need to just start we're like I can't pray all the time do you pray any of the time Have you prayed about the situation at all? Before you ask someone else to pray for you, you need to have prayed for you. It needs to start with you. There will never be a revival in your life until prayer becomes a priority. I don't think you heard that because you got so quiet. There will never be a revival in your life until prayer is a priority in your life. And there will never be a revival at Christian Life Center until prayer is a priority for all of us. That's how revival comes because people, his people, who are called by his name, humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. That is the recipe for revival. We don't talk about, oh, we need to pray. Somebody needs to pray. Yeah, you and me. That's who needs to pray. Now, you may be tired of praying about your request. I understand that. I know how that gets. At some point, I've told people, I said, okay, I'm tired of praying for this need for me, and you're tired of praying for that need for you. Let's just switch. And let me pray for you for a while so I'm not saying the same thing over and over again, and you pray for me. But as a a person who has prayed for something for a long time and then seen God do it, I know how important it is to come along beside you who are tired of praying for that request for that need and to come along like Aaron and Hur did for Moses where they lifted his hands on the mountain so the people of Israel could have victory that's what I want to do for you you say pastor I can't pray for that one more time okay well let me help you pray for that because People came to me when I no longer felt like praying, and they prayed for me, and the answer came. And so, you know, I get tired of 
seeing things happen around the world and not happening here. And people have asked me about that, and why do you think that is, Pastor? And I have told them, I believe it's because people around the world ask for things we don't ask for. Let me get very practical with you for a moment. I, my family has been under attack for the last several weeks and months. And it's overwhelming, one punch after another. You feel like that you're up against Mike Tyson, who is a famous philosopher as well as boxer because he said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And then your plan goes out the window. So I'd, we had had th thing after thing after thing. In one of those things, I'm driving down the road on one of these bad weeks, and my check engine light comes on. And that was like, okay, there's number 34 or 44 of things that are going wrong. And I said, you know, I've had enough of this. Because I, I went to get it diagnosed, and it looked like it was a minor problem. Then I found out it was a major problem. It was going to cost a lot of money. And you may think I'm crazy, and you probably thought that before, and that's okay. But I said, Lord, I've had enough of this. The guy that told me how much it's going to cost, I said, well, maybe I should get rid of it. He said, well, you can't now because the check engine, light, check engine light's on. Nobody wants it. And he said, I could, get it, I could take it off for you, but it'd be about 20 miles. It'd be back on. So I went out, and I laid hands on the hood of my car. And I prayed in the name of the Father, and of the name of the Son, and of the name of the Holy Spirit. And I got in that car, and that check engine light went out, and it's not been back on yet. Every source of attack, I was praying. I asked other people to help me, but I was spending my time on my knees praying for every attack because I've been attacked for years. My family's been attacked for years, but I had never seen the, for, the quantity and the uh, ferociousness of the attacks at this level. And I'm telling you that the reason for that is not because that I am holier than thou. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's because God has a plan for Christian Life Center and the devil doesn't like it. He's trying to stop it and he is attacking because he doesn't want to see it happen. But I'm here today to tell you that I know who I am. I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm a child of the Living God. And I'm here today to tell you that no one, even the devil and all of his imps can stand in the way of God. No one can close the door that he has opened. No one can stop the church because he is our God. He is our Savior. He is our soon coming King. Because I've told the Lord many times, I said, I don't understand why the level of spiritual warfare is like this and the results I'm seeing are like this and some Sundays I feel like they're like this. It weighs on you. And the reason is because I haven't seen the full picture. The reason that the attacks are great is because the results are going to be great, but they haven't happened yet. Veldon, you told me that you had been spending time in, the, in Joshua. The phrase repeated most, most often in Joshua is be strong and courageous. Okay? So not because of who I am, but because of whose I am, the, we are going to see breakthrough. We're going to see signs. We're going to see wonders. We're going to see miracles. We're going to see souls saved. We're going to see people delivered. We're going to see all of these things because we are children of the King. Yes, sir. Now, my personality makes me want to run and jump and dance at that, but I tell you're excited because you're like, okay, I'm going to take that. We're different. You're different. You're never going to be like me, and you're like, thank God. And I'm never going to be like you. 
but I get excited knowing that God is for us. We know who's against us, but we know that he and his forces do not win. If you ever read the end of, end of the book, you'll know that we won. Now, the game is still going. But when the final buzzer sounds, the children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be the victors. There's no mistake, there's no doubt, there's no wonder about that. But I'm here today to tell you that it, the key is prayer. And prayer, when you pray, the enemy wants to bring everything into your mind. He wants to distract you. Why? Because he knows that prayer works. The brother in my home church wrote a song called Prayer Changes Things. And so the enemy doesn't want things changed. He likes chaos. He likes things going out of order. He likes division. He likes hatred. But when we pray, we're humbling ourselves because we're like, God, I can't handle this. I need you to handle it, so I'm turning it over to you. Or as Peter put it in his letter there, I'm casting my care upon you. And that's why you may uh, pray however it is that you pray. You know, the thing about Israel, if you go to the Western Wall in Israel, you cannot bow in prayer. They don't allow it. Because they, th they say that that's what Muslims do. So you can stand and pray. You can s be seated and pray. But you can't bow on your knee. But however it is that you pray, I don't care if you stand on your head as long as you're praying. But if you are not praying, that is the single biggest thing I can tell you as to why you're not living in victory. If you're not praying about the situation, where do you think the help's going to come from? Do you think the government's going to come in and take care of you? <laughs> Define take care of. God says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. And we do that through so if you've never tried prayer or you've not tried it lately, give it a try this week and, and cast all of your care upon him and see how your life changes. Don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. But when we pray, it shouldn't sound like that we're sitting on Santa's lap. I want, I want, I need, I want, I need, I need, I need, I want. I want, I want, I need, I want. Yes, we all have petitions. But let's remember who we're addressing to start with. Sometimes I think we take advantage of the verse that says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. But I wouldn't go before the throne of Queen Elizabeth II and say, hey, I want, I need, I need, hey, can you do this for me? Would you do that for me? Hey, it's all about me here. I need to get things done, and you have the power to do it, so do it for me. How long would I last at Buckingham Palace before the guy with the furry hats throw me out? So why would I go before the king of all kings and immediately start out with, I need, I need, I want, I need, I need, I want. There is a protocol in a royal court. There is a decorum in a royal court. And so I may have access to boldly approach the throne of grace without being executed, but I need to remember as I'm going in who I have an audience with and give him the worship and the glory and the thanksgiving, first of all, worship him for who he is. Nobody else, nobody, no entity, no being deserves the worship that he deserves because there's no one like him. 
He is above time. His ways are above our ways. His understanding is above ours. So why would I rush into his throne room and start making demands of what I need? Let me give you the Greek word for that. Stupid eyes. Stupid. I need to go into there recognizing that he is the creator. He is the Savior. He is the one who has all power, not me. He is the one who is everywhere, not me. He's the one who has uh, all of the might and all of the knowledge. He knows what I need even before I ask, but there's a proper way to ask. How many of you, I know, you know, I grew up, I am so old that I was born not only in the last century, but the last millennium. So I understand that times have changed, but I did not go to my parents and start making demands of what I needed and expect to get anything except slapped in the mouth. So why would I try that method with Almighty God? So you go in, you begin your prayer with worship. You properly address the one to whom you seek an audience with. And he's worthy of all the worship. He's worthy of all the praise. And we need to remember what he's already done for us and thank him before we ask for something else. Have you ever done something for someone and they didn't thank you? And, and you wanted to do it for them, but then when they didn't thank you, it just stung a little bit? What do you think with God when you haven't even thanked him for what he's already done for you? And yet you're demanding him to do more? He still hasn't satisfied your desires? So we need to begin our prayers with worship and thanksgiving and understand who we're addressing. There was a book years ago that talked about what it's like to be Southern. And because I'm Southern, the, the one part that really hit me was the fact that it says, Southern is treating Jesus like your next-door neighbor. He's not your next-door neighbor. Now, I understood what they were saying because, you know, a lot of times in the South we would be out on our porches or whatever and hanging out and be like, yeah, I was just hanging out there with Jesus, had us some sweet tea, and we were going about to have us a mater sandwich, and everything was going all right. He's not your neighbor. He is the second person in the Godhead, God the Son. And the reason that he puts up with us and gives us this unmerited favor is because of his love for us. But we need to respect him. We need to revere him. We need to have, you know, when it says the big, uh, the fear is the beginning of wisdom, it's not that you have to be afraid of God, but you have to recognize that he can wipe you out. You have to have a reverence for him because he's holy. So you can't just run around and say, yeah, me, me and God, we were hanging out the other day, and I said, yeah, I need this and this. And he said, okie dokie. That's not the way it works. But help us to always remember what he's already done for us. If you claim to have a relationship with him, then he's already done a lot with, for you. Because you and I deserved something that we're not getting. We deserve something terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, but we're not getting that because of his amazing grace. And so when we pray, in this, when we start out praying and we're remembering and thanking him for what he's already done, that not only gives him reverence, and thanksgiving, but it helps us to remember. Oh, he's done more for me. He's done a lot for me. So it, it, it helps out. It has more than one benefit. It has multiple benefits that when I start thanking him for things he's done, that also builds my faith that whatever that I'm facing today, he can also take care of. But I'll just rush in and say, I demand that you do this. Wrong answer. Wrong approach. But it builds my faith when I start saying, I thank you when you did that, 
when I was a child and you did this and you came through and you healed me this time and you, you helped me this time and you guided me this time, you protected me this time, you made a way where there was no way. I remember all those times and I thank you, but it also helps me remember he's done it before, he doesn't change, he's able to do it again today because he's done it in the past because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when I do that, it reminds me that I'm not my source, but he is. And we can make our petitions. I'm not saying don't tell him what you need or what you want, but do it in the right order. Do it in the right way. You know, there's some things that you, you can't do just however you want to do them, and they turn out all right. You say, yes, I can, Pastor. Well, I don't want to eat any of your food. Because I believe in people following recipes. You're like, ah, oh, just add a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and hope everything turns out okay. Well, let someone else be your taster. You can make petitions, but have you ever thought about taking a day, a week, a month, a year, and making this your prayer? After you have worshipped him, after you've thanked him, that you say, not my will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I suggest you give it a try. But he doesn't, say, he doesn't end it there. He doesn't say humble yourselves and pray. He goes on to say, and seek my face. Because when you're praying and asking for petitions, you're not seeking his face, you're seeking his hand. You know, as, as I read to you, the mighty hand of God. That's what you're wanting, right? When you're saying, I need, I need, I want, I want. You're wanting him to make it happen. You're wanting him to use his power and do it for you. You're wanting him, you want to see the mighty hand of God move. But what he's saying is, if you want me to hear you from heaven and heal your land, you need to not only humble yourself and pray, but you need to seek his face. What does that mean, Pastor? That means spending quality time with him without asking for anything. We sing, oh, I love you. I love you, Jesus, I love you. When's the last time you went on a date with Jesus? What are you talking about, Pastor? When's the last time that you carved out time in your schedule? And you just spent time with Jesus. Not asking for anything. But talking to him. Nurturing your relationship. Spending time with him, seeking his face, would be to say something like, God, I need you. Every hour I need you. I love you. More than anything else in the world, I love you. I know you love me first, and I appreciate that. The reason that I can come to you is because you love me first. But I also love you, and this is how I love you, and this is why I love you, and this is why I'm thankful for you. And just spend time, for lack of a better term, on a date with him. You remember... You know, I think that, that dating is just for cowards now. I liked it when you had to face the music. If someone didn't want to date me, they swipe away from me. Who cares? I remember when dating was, you went up to somebody and asked them, do you want to go out with me? And they said, yes. Or, are you kidding me? Get out of here. But when you went on a date, the purpose of that date was to get to know that person. Hopefully, if you're a Christian, hopefully it wasn't just carnal lust, but you wanted to get to know that person. You wanted to find out what, where they're from, what, they, what their likes were, what their hobbies were, on and on. What's your favorite music? You spent time getting to know them and building a relationship. You didn't, hopefully, go on that first date with a list of demands. I need you to do this and do that and do this and do that. If you did, that was probably your first and last date. 
But if you don't make time, carve out time in your schedule to spend quality time seeking his face, you say, well, pastor, is that important? Well, he says it is. It's not my idea that you do it. He said that you need to humble yourselves and pray and seek my face. So obviously it's important to him. Sometimes we do that through worship. That we seek his face through the worship music or through the worship song. Sometimes we do that through our prayer. Sometimes we do that in reading his word because sometimes I found that I grow my relationship with him by reading his word and learning how better to live for him when something speaks to me from the word and I'm like, oh wow, I've never seen that before. I've read that verse many times and never seen that. That's the Holy Spirit. And so I'm growing my relationship. I'm nurturing that relationship. It's getting stronger. The roots are growing deeper and getting stronger. And that's why we need to seek God's face. Instead of going in with a list of demands like, like we have a bunch of hostages. So we spend time in his presence. And just don't ask him for anything. <laughs> for once, maybe. Just don't ask him for anything. Just worship him and spend time with him. Converse with him. You're like, well, I don't think the right word is converse, Pastor. It is for me. I remember when people wanted to think that Vice President Michael Pence was delusional because he talked about God speaking to him. <laughs> well, if he's delusional, honey, count me in that group. Because prayer is a dialogue. I talk to the Lord, the Lord speaks to me. He doesn't speak to me audibly. But when you pray with your Bible open, many times he will drop in your spirit a verse, you turn to that verse, and he has a message for you in that verse. Sometimes he just gives you an impression in your spirit. But you don't know that, and you won't know that if you're constantly going to him and saying, I need, I need, I want, I need. If you have the kind of God that you can manipulate, I don't want any part of your God. I want a God who knows everything, who is everywhere and has all power. So humble yourself. Don't make him do it. Be proactive. Pray and seek his face. It will change but don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I pray that if pride is a factor in any heart and any life, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would reveal that to each individual right now. Maybe there are those here that don't realize that pride has been a problem, that you've been resisting them because of pride. But God, I pray that you would turn your searchlight on each heart and each life and that you would reveal any area of pride and that then the individual can ask forgiveness. And then, Lord, you will exalt that individual and give them your grace. God, I pray that you would ignite a fire in each heart to pray. And not a little lay me down to sleep prayer, but actually getting a hold of you prayer. God, I pray that those who helped us pray for 16 minutes a day before Holy Week, God, I pray that they've just increased that. But God, I pray that each person that you would birth in them a craving, a desire, a passion to pray that was spread throughout our congregation and literally ignite this church into revival. And God, I pray that each person who can hear me right now will begin to set aside time in their schedule from this service forward to just seek not asking for a single thing, but worshiping you, communing with you, talking with you, spending quality time with you. And God, I pray that you would use this as a time where that we realize that 
if we want to keep getting what we're getting, we keep doing what we're doing. But I sense a desire in people's hearts and lives to get something different. So we're going to have to approach it differently. So God, I pray that you would help each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, they're going to go into worship. If you need to spend some time in prayer, then you take care of that first. If you need to ask God about your pride and and showing you where that pride is and dealing with it, then you need to take care of that first. But if you've already humbled yourself, then you need to pray, and you need to pray about something. Now would be a good time to petition the Lord, but start out worshiping Him and thanking Him for what He's already done. Maybe you just need to spend some time seeking His face right now. Maybe you need special prayer. You can come forward for that. But if you don't need any of that, then you can stand and worship when you get ready. Mm-hmm. 